Hello once again, my name is Charles R. Sable doing another teaching video in the book of Isaiah, the Bible commentary that I wrote in all of 2018 and half of 2019 till July of 2019. And then it was published and on, back on the market in January of 2020. This is a hardback binder textbook for your seminary classes, for your undergraduate studies, as well as Bible studies. Um, many people misinterpret the book of Isaiah and don't understand it. The, the Lord has provided me proper understanding through the years. I mean, come on. I've read the Bible cover to cover 11 times. All right. I can count them 11 times. I did it in 11 straight years. Now, I've been doing teaching videos and digging and, and and writing commentary so that's my word when i when i'm digging i read into his word and he, and he communicates with me on what's correct i do the research and the proper humanetics to come up with the actual correct interpretation of isaiah here chapter 34 is unrealized by many i have seen other commentaries they do acknowledge this as being the creation of lake and fire and so there are some people that have been shown the truth but here you have it this i mean the chapter 33 the previous chapter was talking about the time of king hezekiah and the assyrians that were attacking um jerusalem before the, the revival and then the, the the falling away again and then destruction so that was quite a while ago wasn't it well 34 fast forwards to the last day of the seven year tribulation day 2520 of the seven years this is the day that chapter 34 is about okay as you know that's the day of the second coming of christ well before he lands on mount olives in jerusalem he goes here and creates the lake of fire okay because he prepared the lake of fire because uh, when he lands in on Mount olives in jerusalem and destroys the the people and casts the antichrist and false prophet into the lake of fire he had to have already created it right well he did right before he had arrived on mount olives he had gone here first and created the lake of fire what is that what's this all about what do you mean he created the lake of fire of course he did he's the creator of the universe all right so the lake of fire doesn't exist as we speak but it will on the last day of the seven year tribulation so in chapter 34 isaiah brings to knowledge the fate of the world within the last days he uses disturbing imagery to convey that he has been shown by the lord to describe this extremely devastating time on the earth further explained by the other prophets isaiah explains various events of the time right before the second coming of christ um through the time of eternal through the time of the eternal kingdom so as you get to the end of chapter 34 we're talking about the eternal kingdom where the lake of fire is still in, in, in view of the people that are in god's eternal kingdom so it's an amazing chapter if you think about all that i'm just talking about just now amazingly isaiah explains the creation of the lake of fire prophesied by john in revelation 20 right john prophesied about the lake of fire and the judgment right it's called the judgment throne of christ or the judgment throne well the lake of fire where all the unrighteous are cast well god had to create the lake of fire somewhere right and it's a true lake of fire it it, it will exist he doesn't it doesn't just appear god does something to make it to, to create it right theologians will overlook this and fail to discern the eschatological significance of this chapter concerning this very important prophecy of the future all right let's look at it break it down come near you nations to hear and hearken you people let the earth hear and all that is therein the world and the, all the things that come forth of it all right so it has not been since isaiah 1 verse 2 that isaiah alerted the entire earth to hear and hearken this includes not only the people of the earth but all things of the earth this is the first time since the second verse of the entire book of isaiah it is so important for the nations of the earth to hear and hearken listen that he commands them to come near he commands those that hearken to let the entire earth hear speak it which includes all that is there in existence and all that comes forth of the earth what is about to be conveyed within this chapter is so important 
because it affects all things on earth when it comes to pass. It's heavy. It's heavy. Verse 2, for the, for the indignation, or because the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies, he hath utterly destroyed them, he has delivered them to the slaughter. Now, this is, passage speaks in exclusivity, or excuse me, inclusivity, that the indignation wrath of the Lord will destroy every army upon their armies of every nation upon all nations upon the earth all nations this hasn't happened before god hasn't destroyed all the nations of the earth the arm all the armies of the nations of the earth when's he going to destroy all the nations of, all of the earth it's going to be at armageddon right so this is um the, the speak first speaking about the indignation of the lord um on this day right there will be certain events upon the earth separate from another, which this prophecy fits together in an inclusive, in, in inclusive way. All armies will be destroyed, but not all at the same event. There will be a Psalm 83 battle, which will destroy the surrounding nations of Israel army. That will be before or before this, the, the um, trip period, the seven years. While the Ezekiel 38 battle destroys the other armies uh, battle destroys other other armies that are attacking israel and that's on day one of the seven years right which will separate from that psalm 83 prophecy so separate armies being destroyed there there will be an attack on the hidden and protected remnant of israel from uh, Revelation 14, 14 through 20, Isaiah 34, 5 through 6, and Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. So th this chapter is talking about the same events that, that it's located here. This chapter, what we're about to talk about, can be talked about here. With those armors also destroyed, which is separate from the final or finale, finale at Armageddon is the finale, Revelation 19 with the destruction of all the armies of the nations of the earth set to be destroyed god reveals that it is he who is delivering them to their slaughter all right he has delivered them to the slaughter so we're on the verge all right you're seeing the news right now today being september 5th israel is doing exchanges with syria right now <clears throat> and iran so these military exchanges aren't it talked about in the news media because they want to hide it from you. They're evil. They don't want you to know what's going on over in the Middle East. Well, right now, Syria and Israel are exchanging missiles. So the Isaiah 17, 1 prophecy of the destruction, complete annihilation of the city of Damascus in one day is about to happen. All right. Scary stuff, huh? Well, if you trust in the Lord, it's not scary. Because we're about to be raptured out of here. Verse 3. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Wow. Who's this? Verse 3 is a little difficult when considering the four different slaughters mentioned from the previous verse. Right? Four different slaughters. I said, remember I told you the Psalm 83 battle? People, a lot of many nations are going to be slaughtered there. Nations, militaries, Ezekiel three eight through nine. We know of uh, the militaries there uh, will be slaughtered, and then the slaughter talk being talked about here in verses five and six, and as well as Armageddon. So there's a lot of different slaughters, right? Only three of the four slaughters can be included in verse three, right? Because the battle of Armageddon does not happen in a mountain, but a valley. Joel 3.2 says, I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's Armageddon. It's a valley, not a mountain, right? So those of you that think Daniel 11 is about um, Armageddon, you're completely deceived. In addition, the blood from Armageddon cannot melt down the mountains if the people are killed in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Right? Kidron Valley. 
with this logic and the theologians don't even think about this they don't even, I, I see people that are being put on a pedestal right now because he knows eschatology so well and he's telling people well, what this is going to happen to this guy but he never talks about the fact that armageddon is in a valley and so there's no way that it's going to melt the valleys or melt the mountains um so with this logic we must consider this slaughter to be just one excuse me <laughs> all right which in indicates an accumulation of blood such as revelation 14 14 through 20 if you remember the accumulation of blood up the horse's bridle in that chapter it's the same thing happening in um, isaiah 34 verses 5 and 6 so we're going to get there hang on Verse 20 of Isaiah 14, and the winepress was trodden without the city, that means out of, outside of the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even into the horse's bridles, by the space of 1,600 furlongs, right? Okay, so the dimensions of the lake of fire is provided here, All right? Or at least the, the, um, the size, okay? Blood is a liquid and, fl and will flow downhill. So the accumulation of blood to the horse's bridles would indicate a lake of blood within the space of 1,600 furlongs. I think we can all agree on that. The blood somehow melts the mountains to allow this blood to accumulate as the lake described. The mountains shall be melted with their blood. Right? So hopefully you're following me here. In Isaiah 63, verse 3, the Lord declares that he had trodden the winepress alone. The winepress is what John describes where the blood came out of with, within Revelation 14, 20. The Revelation 14, 14 through 20, and Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, winepress events are the same. The Israeli remnant being rescued will ask the Lord, Isaiah 63, 2. Wherefore are you red in your apparel, and your garments like him that treads in the wine fat? The wine press, the wine fat. In Isaiah 34, 6, the description of the blood sacrifices uses the word fatness. The connection with this blood sacrifice links all three passages together as the same event, especially when Isaiah 63, 1 declares, with thy garments from Basra. Isaiah 34 verse 6 declares the Lord had a sacrifice in Basra. It's connected. It's the same. Same event. Here we go. There's a map. There's Basra on the map right here. See the Dead Sea? See where Basra is? Right? Petra is way down here right Jerusalem's way up here right look at where Basra is where this lake of fire is going to be created in Basra all right so I I, use, I, I say halfway between the, the Dead Sea and Petra on other maps it is but this particular map it shows it like mm, third of the direction way so Let's go to the, let's keep going. Not all of Jews will make it through to the second coming of the Lord. Two thirds of the Jews will be cut off and die because they have chosen to not believe in Jesus Christ as their savior. They are even, there are even many of the modern day Jews who are considered atheists or agnostic and do not believe in God of their father Abraham. Just as Satan has accomplished through the ages, he has deceived them and pulled them away from the one true living God. I'm going to read you Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass that in that land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall come, excuse me, they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, this is, this is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. So this is where... <clears throat> I get the information that one third of the remnant of Israel alive today will be brought through the entire seven years and 
will be brought through the fire, right? And they'll be brought through the third part through the fire right here. If you look at this, two thirds are going to die. Two thirds of Israel right now that exists are going to die during the seven years. One third will be protected. And if you read Revelation chapter 12, you'll see how they're protected. That's where on day 1261, they will flee from the abomination of desolation and flee to the mountains or wilderness, right? Jesus Christ provided the children of Israel with a warning in Matthew 24, right? Israel obviously doesn't pay attention to this warning now as unbelievers, but someday it will occur to them and they will be reminded where this warning came from, can be found. They will open to Matthew 24 and read it and then they will take Jesus' advice and flee to the mountains. There will be believers. They'll say, the, Jesus said, flee to the mountains. Let's go, let's go. This guy, the Antichrist is an abomination. Let's go. Get out of here. We're in danger. And that, they will flee, right? Verse 20, chapter 24, verses 15 and 16. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Then let them be, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, right? The Jews will flee as Jesus had warned them. Not every Jew will flee, but only a remnant. Remember I told you that? I already told you that. One third of them. God will protect this remnant as they flee and keep them safe. The Bible is not clear where exactly they flee to. Many believe that they will flee to the place called Petra. I believe it because there's, there's not another place on the planet, close to Jerusalem especially, where um, approximately two million Jews can be protected without the Antichrist being able to find him. Petra matches this exactly. It's in the mountains and it's in the valley, or excuse me, in the mountains and in the wilderness. So the mountains and wilderness, uh, not many people are familiar with Petra. This is this photograph here is an example of what Petra looks like. It was, um, I explain it right here. During the Iron Age, approximately 1200 BC, an area was inhabited by the Edomites. Edom is an Aramaic word for red. The name was taken of the, by these people because they descended from the red-haired Esau, who was twin brother of Jacob, Israel. The Edomites controlled the trade routes between the Arabian Peninsula and Damascus in what is today Syria. According to the Bible, King David subdued the Edomites around 1000 BC. The Edomites continued to fight against the Judeans until uh, until in one battle, the Judean king Amaziah defeated 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt, captured, captured Salah in battle, 2 Kings 14.25. Salah, also meaning rock in Greek, is sometimes thought to be a high outcropping of Um al -Bayraya, Bayara in, the, in Petra. Right? The Edomites lived under Assyrian, Babylonian, and eventually Persian influence until the 4th century BC. The area seems to first have attracted the attention of the, ne the uh, Nabataeans, moving slowly north with their cattle and sheep from the Arabian Peninsula. The first recorded reference of the Nabataeans is from the 1st century BC Greek historian Di Diodorus. He wrote that the Seleucid king Antigonus, a one-eyed successor to Alexander the Great, sent his general Athenius to attack the land of the Arabs in 312 BC. These Arabs were called Nabataeans. The Nabataeans resisted the Seleucids and by the second century BC were firmly settled in the area with Petra as their capital. So there's the history of Petra. The ruins of Petra is currently a tourist attraction and not inhabited. Because this place is thought of as a mostly, most likely that the Jews will flee to, they'll be like, where can we go? Well, I know of a place called Petra. It's just a tourist attraction now, and it can fit all of us. Well, let's go, let's go. We're going to Petra. The word will get out, and the, God, the Lord himself will show them the way. Right? This is the one place that the Lord has reserved. Did you notice what I said? It is a tourist attraction now. It's not inhabited. So it's ready. It's reserved for them. Think about it. It's a tourist attraction. that Nobody can inhabit it. So it's reserved for an accumulation of Jews to stay during that last three and a half years of the seven years. Right? All right. They may remember Petra and, and, his, and its history and flee there. This verse in Revelation 12, 14 gives an indication that God will protect the woman, Israel, for a time, one year, times two years and a half. 
half year, which equals to three and a half years. This will be the last three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel. Right after the abomination of desolation, the remnant of Israel will flee to the mountains, the wilderness. Petra matches both descriptions of being into the wilderness as well as into the mountains. As you can see this, I mean, there's many pictures of, of Petra, if you want to keyword it. Many pictures of Petra. It is in the mountains, and it's in the wilderness. Both. All right, so, um, Revelation 12, 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. That's God giving them the ability to travel, that she might fly to, into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nursed for a time, and times and half a time for the pluff from the face of the serpent. Right? Remember, day 1261, Satan is sent, cast out of heaven to the ground in the last three and a half years. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation, because Satan then has control of his dominion and really brings the Antichrist into the most evil time of, and gives, empowers him, actually. Um, I have a Bible commentary on the book of Revelation where I explain chapter 13 as well, as well as chapter 12. Also, I mean, I'll be all of them, but Jesus Christ will go to a place called Basra before he comes down to the earth at his second coming. He, we can utilize three passages in the scriptures to verify that this visit to Basra will occur. That's Isaiah 34, verses 3 through 6, Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, and Revelation 14, 14 through 20. We, he will fulfill prophecy of a great slaughter, which he will reap over the heathen who seem to have been coming to destroy that remnant of Israel. The remnant will be hiding and waiting in Petra, Basra of Edom, is now Busara, some 20 miles southeast of the Dead Sea and halfway between the Dead Sea and Petra. Okay. Now you got the format of what's happening here. They are, they have been protected by God for 1260 days or 1259 until now, 1260 now. All of a sudden the Antichrist then knows that for some reason he is let know known that the Israel is hiding in Petra. For some reason, God said that God let them find this out. I mean, God supernaturally hides them, right? Two million Jews hiding in Petra. You can't hide two million Jews anywhere else, especially that close to Israel. Petra is the place that God will supernaturally hide the Jews there. You, you tell, show me another place that can hold two million Jews and hide them. Come on. It doesn't exist except for Petra. Verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls off from the vine and as a falling fig from the tree. This is the last day, remember, of the seven years. Day 2520. Right? Keep that in mind. This passage, one of the most troubling passages in the Bible, in Genesis 2, 1, the word of God refers to the host of them when talking about the heavens and the earth. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. Now, I just wrote a commentary on Genesis 1 through 11, and I believe the host is actually the angels. But in the case here, many people take this as the stars, right? The word host used here is defined by the Strong's Concordance to Saba. The same Hebrew word to Saba is used in this passage. Though there are passages which the to Saba refers to the heavenly host of angels, which I believe this is it, this is in Genesis 2 1. The context here in this verse 4 should be understood as stars of the second heaven. First heaven is Earth's atmosphere, second heaven is Earth's stars and planets, third heaven is God's home. This prophecy implies that all stars of the second heaven will be dissolved, right? Host of heaven shall be dissolved. Now, the plural word is used for the heavens. Therefore, we must concur that it includes two of the three heavens, while God's heaven remains, sep heavens, heaven remains separate and intact. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. While the stars dissolve, the Earth's atmosphere and the universe itself will be rolled together. It will be rolled together as a scroll, which is not a roll, but a scroll. The word scroll is only used in one place in the Old Testament, and that is in Isaiah 34.4, the verse we're reading. 
Isaiah used the Hebrew word sefer, which was then translated to the King James translators to be scroll. Historically, a scroll was a complete book rather than a roll being a small segment of a book. So therefore, or there is a difference between a roll and a scroll if a person reviews historically what each one represented. A scroll is a document or a book that has two rolls together. There's a scroll, right? A scroll has two rolls, which may represent each of the two heavens being rolled together. So the Earth's atmosphere and the entire universe will be, will be rolled together. The second sentence is then to be determined to be related to the previous sentence. The host are to be considered the stars, which will be dissolving from within the second heaven. All stars will be simultaneously falling and dissolving, while two heavens are rolling together as a scroll. Isaiah uses imagery to describe the manner which the stars will fall. While dissolving, the falling stars will float downward like a leaf falling from a vine. Kind of... While others will be dropping quickly like a fig falling off a branch. The supernatural event of God's judgment has never been seen. So we must only speculate upon the imagery and realize that the event described is the tearing apart of the creation. It will be accomplished at the hand of the one who created it in order to bring the final judgment upon the wicked of the earth. This event can be read further of in Revelation 6, 12 through 17 and is connected with the declaration of the coming wrath in Isaiah 42, 15. Now, I have since changed this and my uh, uh, belief is that the event is in Revelation 6, 12 through 17, it's the first day of the seven years. And John says the, the heaven, heavens are rolled apart, depart as a scroll. So on day one, the heavens roll apart as a scroll. And day 2520, the last day, they roll together as a scroll. And that amazing. Verse 5. I wrote the commentary on the book of Revelation after I wrote this. So obviously this has gone into publication and I can't change it until I take it away from Dorrance and republish it somewhere else. Then they'll get the new copy and then it'll be correct in there. Um, verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down from Edomia and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of God is bathed, or the word Rava, which means to take one's fill. God's sword takes his fill in the third heaven where he dwells. God's sword will come down upon Edomia, which points to the ancient place of the Edomites. This passage points to the location rather than the people of ancient Edom. The remaining clause points to the people who the judgment will fall upon and upon the people of my curse. So it's not upon the Edomites. It's upon the people, the location of the of Edomia will shall come down on Edomia and upon the people of my curse. So in Edomia, old Edomia, he's given us the location, and then upon the people of his curse. The people of his curse are the ones that are going to be attacking Israel on the last day of the seven years. They're coming because they found out where they are. God opened their eyes and said, "Look, that's where they are. Come now and get them. Come and get them. I got a surprise for you. Come and get them." God's curse in this case is against those who will have chosen to destroy God's remnant. The remnant will be those who he, whom he will have sent have been protecting for the three and one half years at Petra. The people of God's curse will be headed to Petra, but God's wrath will fall upon them in the land of Edomia. God will bring his sword and take his fill bathed. He will slaughter the people of his curse in the land of Edomia. Well, the land of the Edomites. Well, we're going to get there. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with its fatness. Look at that. The blood is made with fat with its fatness. The blood, the wine fat. And with the blood of the lambs and the goats. With the, with the fat of the kidneys and the rams of the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Right? Busra. The land of Edomia. And a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. Right? So we know the location now. Right? And he's got imagery, imagery of his own sacrifice. He's comparing the sacrifice as his own blood sacrifice. This is God's blood sacrifice, right? His blood sacrifice is coming. This passage reflects the bloodbath of God's 
curse. He will destroy the army of the people of his curse. Verse 5. As mentioned concerning verse 3, the winepress will be full of the fatness of the blood, like a blood sacrifice at God's altar. The blood of the sacrifice represents life. Genesis 9 4, which God had declared within Leviticus 17 11. Mankind has been has mankind has been breaking God's everlasting covenant covenant ever since he had declared it upon mankind after the flood. Genesis 9, 1 through 17, the everlasting covenant was for all of mankind, and they've been killing each other ever since. The continue conti including the abortions. The continuous bloodshed of the people who are made in God's image has been an offense to him. God will bring his final judgment upon all of humanity. The sacrifice in Baza represents God's wrath and sacrifice for mankind's sins against him when they combine to continually break the everlasting covenant of, Je of Genesis 9. The people of God's curse will be headed to spill the blood of his remnant of Israel, whom he will have been protecting. Right? And I'll read you that. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Well, he, remember, he already had, God the Father already had a sacrifice. He sacrificed his only son. Well, all those people who don't believe in that sacrifice are being, are the ones that are, are killing babies and what have you, murdering other people. Well, they are the people of the curse. Verse 1420 again, I'll read it. And the wine press was trodden without the city, away from Jerusalem, without the city of Jerusalem, away from it, about 20 miles from south of the Dead Sea, and blood came out of the wine press, even into the horse's bridles, by the space of 1,600 furlongs. There we have this, the size of the lake of fire, right? The manifestation described within verse 4 is directly linked to the sword of God. God's sword will be casting to the earth his stars from heaven. There is imagery that could be interpreted as the destruction by the nuclear warheads. But, I mean, I gave you my cover based of this entire book is the cover illustrating Isaiah 34, the creation of the lake of fire. You see Isaiah um, up there or down here, down below. That's Isaiah with his hand up to the Lord. He's seeing the vision of the creation of the lake of fire. There's stars falling into the blood in this case causing fire we'll see what we'll see how that can be as we already know from isaiah 17 nuclear strikes will be brought to the earth the devastation described as stars falling from heaven could be in conjunction with the nuclear exchanges upon the face of the earth second 5 4 when god will direct his stars to fall upon basra in the land of edomia in order to counter satan's attack against israel Right? Revelation twelve seventeen reveals that he's coming after after Israel. His Satan was cast from from heaven and he's going after Israel. Right? Isaiah thirty four seven. And the unicorns <laughs> Oh boy. The this this is the, people say unicorns, oh you guys believe in unicorns? That's because the translators have been denied uh, they, 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 they made up this word unicorns because it's what, it's what the, 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 um, the Latin word for, for, for the actual animal they're talking about could, has the word unicorn in it. Okay. Well, what is this animal unicorn? What does unicorn mean? One corn, right? One horn. All right. The, the, the unicorn shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness this is an imagery of blood a lake of blood the word unicorn is derived from a latin description of the rhinoceros unicornis if you look in the 1812 or whatever it is uh, webster's dictionary or 1890 or whatever it is webster's dictionary rhinoceros unicornis you would be a picture of a of a, a one-horned unicorn, which is the one-horned Indian rhinoceros. Its cousin is the black rhinoceros bicornis of Africa. Rhinoceros bicornis and rhinoceros unicornis. That's why the rhinoceros has to be described as either a unicornis or bicornis. There's two different kinds of rhinoceros. This that God is talking about here is the Indian rhinoceros. 
right? The, the 1828, okay, there's a year. Noah Webster's Dictionary properly referenced the indifference between the two types of rhinoceros. Satan has removed this from the dictionary so that we wouldn't know. And so it brought unbelievers in the Bible because they, th they know that unicorns, uh, the, the, the myth of a unicorn, a horse with a horn, is, a, is mythology, Greek mythology. Well, people come into disbelief when they realize the Bible's talking about, ooh, the Greek mythology. Well, no, it's the proper translation is rhinoceros unicornus is what we're talking about here. But the evil desires of the adversary sought to take this out of the modern day dictionaries. They sought to promote falsehood in the Bible, as well as pagan beliefs of a one horned horse called a unicorn. Here's your pictures of the rhinoceros unicornus and the rhinoceros bicornus. All right. So anywhere you see unicorn in the Bible, we're talking about this creature right here. Rhinoceros unicornus. All right. The rhinoceros unicornus will come down to the slaughter with the people of the curse from verse 5. Along with the rhinoceros unicornus, the bullock, young bulls, will come to the land with adult bulls. This passage implies that when the events were to manifest, a land soaked with blood, these animals will come down to the land. That's what God has, God has prophesied this. This, believe it or not, is going to be their land for eternity. They are going to dwell around the lake of fire. The reference to their land refers back to verse 6. The land of the Edomians is who the word there is referencing to. The Edomians land will be soaked with blood and the Edomians dust will be made fat with fatness. The fat is an acceptable offering unto the Lord. His fat sacrifice will be an acceptable sacrifice of his judgment to consume the wicked. The, the violators of the everlasting covenant of, of um, Genesis 9, 1 through 17. The land of Edomia will be God's sacrificial altar, while the blood will be a massive accumulation in fatness, which is the abundance, which is in abundance. This will be an acceptable sacrifice made fat with fatness will be his sacrifice, his sacrifice for their sins. Something atoning, just saying, you guys deserve wrath for the 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 abortions, the abor the people that do the abortions, the people that have the abortions, the people that um, protest for the abortions, um, the people that kill other people, the people that um, vote that uh, or uh, that are juries that vote that they shouldn't go take to have the death penalty, but should go to life in prison. They're in violation of everlasting covenant too, because God invoked the. Um, death penalty on murderers right so uh, doctors that work in uh, abortion clinics deserve to be um brought the death penalty against well god's death penalty is being invoked here he is then taking the death penalty away from mankind to to utilize and takes it upon himself back i am now going to um penalize people for the violation of the everlasting covenant with What's going on in Edomia here? God's sacrifice. Verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the fear of recompenses. Repay. Repay. For the controversy of Zion. The day of the Lord is a common theme among the prophets. And here you have the day of the Lord mentioned in all these Old Testament prophets. It can be understood to be a time when God will vindicate his people and bless their endeavors. But the prophets also imply that it is time of great judgment, which will bring destruction and terror. The passage here is directly referring to his last day's final judgments against the wicked, the day of the Lord's vengeance. The year of the Lord's recompenses or reward will, be, will also be reconciled during this time. The controversy of Zion is the dispute over who is correct in salvation. The false religions have been confronted here and you're, those that say that it's salvation is through Buddha or, or, or Joseph Smith or, or um, uh, 144,000, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, wherever they are, um, God is mm -hmm. going to settle the controversy right here. The controversy of Zion. Who is God and where does salvation lie? The ones who are right about salvation are those who will not be included in the Lord's vengeance and receive their reward of recompenses. 
Those who worship Jesus Christ as their God and Savior will be rewarded, while those who deny him will face God's vengeance. Recompenses is repay, repayment, right? Verse 9, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Whoa! You mean all that blood? All that blood? Okay, the streams refer here to the flowing streams of blood, which were running from the vastness of blood accumulated in the land of Edomia. God will, remember, the mountains of blood, there's so much blood that it, it will melt the mountains and cause a lake of blood. That's what, that's what the previous verses had indicated. So we have a lake of blood here, and the, the rhinoceros and bulls and bullocks are there. God, God will cause the streams of the blood to turn into pitch. Pitch is translated here from the Hebrew word zapheth, which is defined as pitch or tar. God will also turn the dust, the dirt, of the land of Edomia into brimstone. The word brimstone is translated from the Hebrew word gopherinth, which is defined as sulfur or inflammable. So brimstone is inflammable. It's okay. The land of Edomia will become a burning pitch and brimstone. The brimstone will be a heat incubator for the vastness of the flames so the tar or pitch is burning while the the uh, brimstone is incubating the heat right it's an incubator the area covered with this pitch and brimstone will be by the space of a thousand and six furlongs that's in revelation 14 20 so we know the size of this lake of fire right here the land will become a lake of fire burning pitch and brimstone and you're not going to hear this by too many people that think they know the bible there are theologians that do know this correctly and i would listen to them because this is, is this takes some homework to put it together but this is you're getting this i did the research for you you now are blessed with the truth here oh my oh my this obviously is volcanic, but it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. There's probably going to be more fire, right? More fire, like this, right? As the stars fall, or nuclear warheads fall, it shall not be quenched night or day. Verse 10 is, I'm sorry. It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So how long? Just a few years? hundred years? A thousand years? No. Forever. The lake of fire burning pitch and brimstone will burn for eternity. Forever. It will not be quenched neither night nor day and from generation to generation will I waste and burning the expression generation to generation will apply to generations of mankind while the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ will last 1000 years this expression should not be implied upon the sentence before it the lake of fire will be there forever as well as all through the generations of the millennial kingdom it will lie waste during the millennial kingdom and no one will ever pass through it for eternity all right so we're going to read revelation 20 14 and 15 and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written the book of life was cast into the lake of fire well if you're I don't know if you're familiar with revelation 20 but the millennial kingdom happened before this this is this is what happens on judgment day everybody was judged the unrighteous will be judged according to their works and cast into the lake of fire forever right well verse 11 but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it and he shall stretch up out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness what the cormorant is translated from the hebrew word kaath which is defined as ceremonial ceremonial unclean bird right the bittern is translated from the hebrew word quipaud which is the hedgehog or porcupine, right? The unclean bird or, oh, I'm sorry, the unclean bird and hedgehog will possess the land around the lake of fire, while the owl and the raven dwell in the area as well. All of these animals are unclean animals 
and w which the occult have used as symbols of their worship of Moloch, who represents their god, Satan. Since we know that no one will pass through it for eternity, then the lines of confusion and stones of emptiness will be for those inhabiting the place. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life will be cast into it, so the souls inhabiting the lake of fire will experience the confusion, despair, and the emptiness without happiness. All good things in this world come from God, whereas the lake of fire will be inhabited by those who chose not to accept God in their eternity. Therefore, they will feel confusion and emptiness. All right? Pretty bad. There's people that still refuse to come to the Lord. Verse 12. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. We must first trace back and understand who they are. The last reference to a human is in verse 10, where none shall pass through it forever and ever. The people will call for the nobles and princes from the past to join them in the eternal kingdom. But no one, oh, excuse me, but none of them will respond nor be there. So the righteous are in the new eternal kingdom and they're looking for their nobles and princes, the people who we thought they were righteous. Where are they? Where are they? I thought they were going to be here. Some of these pastors have stand at a pulpit and preach God, uh, heresy. Will, peop with, well, will people of eternity see them burning and call them to join them in paradise? Hey, come on, come on, come on. Just step a few hundred feet and you can come in here in paradise with me. No, if they could hear them calling, they could not join them nor respond, right? They could probably see them burning, but that's it. Their, their souls are burning. They can't move out of the place. So it's, it's unfathomable for us, but this is kind of like what it's saying here. Verses 13 and 15 through 15, three verses, should be read together. And the thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in, their, in the forests thereof, and it shall be an inhabitation of dragons and a court of owls. The next three verses are imagery provided by Isaiah of the destiny of the once elite places of the world. Though Isaiah promises this to be literal fulfillment within verse 16, there is also spiritual imagery being applied here. With the female pronoun used in reference to her places, Isaiah speaks of a church. The false church or the occult churches will have thorns come up in her place, places. This is a spiritual reference to the fall in the Garden of Eden when the mankind's earthly lives would be cursed with thorns, briars, brambles, and thistles, nettles. The wealthy places such as palaces and fortresses would no longer be a place of successful existence, but full of thorns, thistles, and briars. The palaces and fortresses will no longer inhabit humans, but of the animals of the occult religion had, had used as their symbols for their god, Moloch. So these animals that the the occult had used as their symbols will be inhabiting their fortresses right just god's more or less in your face in your face you evil people the wild beasts of the desert this is verse 14 the wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island and the satire shall cry to his fellow the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest the wild beasts of the desert would like a desert, the desolate, hot, and dry place to, to inhabit. The wild beasts of the island are also the desert, desert dwellers who yelp and howl while living off the desolate land. The satire is a demonic possessed goat who will be crying amongst its fellow satires. The female owl will be at rest in this hot, dry, and desolate place being described by Isaiah. A little bit of imagery going on, right? Satires don't really exist except for in the demonic realm, right? So satires is imagery of all their their evil will just they, they, they're they're crying for uh, you know it's the dead at the lake of fire. Where's our satires that we were worshiping? What happened to them that we were worshiping? Can't they help us? You know, 
verse 15, Though should be a great owl, there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with her mate. All right? The owl, which represents the occult and the worship of Moloch, will be at rest and will lay and hatch its young in a desolate, desolate place. Those who use them as idols of worship instead will be burning in fire. The vulture represents the birds of prey who fed on the dead flesh as a scavenger. They would be gathered within with their mates, right? They'll be gathered, the, the vultures will be gathered with their mate. Isaiah paints a place of destitute and no glory found in anything living within the land. The animals used once as idols of worship will instead be living in, the, in peace in a dry, hot, dry, and desolate place. Meanwhile, next to them, the wicked will be burning for eternity, right? So these these beasts, or birds and beasts, will not be in the lake of fire, but be living around the land, around the lake of fire. It's their um, designated place for eternity. Verse 16, Seek you out of the book of the Lord, and read, no one of these shall fail, none so want her mate for my mouth for my mouth it has commanded and his spirit it has gathered them after pointing to the destitute of the lake of fire in eternity isaiah commands for everyone to seek the word of god and read it <clears throat> excuse me isaiah promises that none of what he has explained within chapter 34 will fail none of it isaiah points back to the vulture's mate not one vulture will lack their mate because this prophecy, prophecy will be fulfilled completely. Isaiah declared that as his mouth had commanded it, God's Holy Spirit will gather every one of these animals, just as he had gathered the animals to Noah's Ark. Pretty clear to me. I know you guys read this probably as a what? As sure as, as, sure as what he, how God has declared it through Isaiah, it's going to happen. Verse 17, <clears throat> and he has passed a lot for them, and his hand has divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation, they shall dwell therein. God is who Isaiah is implying to here, who has cast a lot for the creatures to remain in this location around the lake of fire for eternity. These particular creatures have been given this location as their eternal habitation, which does not include the beasts listed in Isaiah 11, 6 through 8. None of these beasts that have been here in Isaiah 34 were mentioned in 11, 6 through 8. The animals of Isaiah 11, 6 through 8 will dwell with mankind in eternity, while the beasts mentioned within Isaiah 34, 13 through 15, have been divided into their inheritance to this location. God has cast a literal lot for these beasts to dwell in this domain nearest to the lake of fire. They have a border or line which they will never cross. Right? He, his hand has divided it unto them by line. God has divided it unto them by line. They will possess this location forever. They shall possess it forever. Right? So that's it. There you go. Chapter 34 is complete. If you have any questions, please ask. Questions down, be down below. Also, hit like. Subscribe to my channel. Uh, appreciate you watching this important video. Uh, hopefully, it shed some light on it. Uh, so, uh, here you have the Lake of Fire then uh, on day 2520 is created. Then, if you read Revelation 19, that then starts to occur. Um, Isaiah 63, 1 through 6 is the aftermath of this occurring as Jesus rides from causing the lake of fire, creating the lake of fire, all the blood, his blood wrenched apparel, then approaches the Jews hidden in Petra. Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6 is the exchange verbally between the people, the Jews of Petra and Jesus as he's riding in on his horse and blood stained apparel amazing stuff amazing stuff that's why in his coming down from from heaven with the, with his church his raiment is dressed dipped in blood 
because of this particular uh, event happened just before it. All right. Anyway, that's what I've come up with for you. Hit like down below. Until the next time, have your health a blessed day.